As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. In 1977, Jimmy Coonan, along with five other close members of his West East crew, would meet in Mickey Featherstone's apartment to discuss a sit-down where they were called to by the boss of all bosses at the time, Paul Castellano. This is something Coonan had spent the last 10 years working towards, but the men weren't sure if the meeting was going to be good news for the crew or if they were being lured to the sit-down to be whacked. Over the recent murder of Fat Tony Solano's right-hand man, Lone Shark and bookmaker Ruby Stein, Stein was lured to the Westies 596 Club by DeMeo crew member Danny Grillo, who was also good friends with Coonan in the Westies, where he would be shot and his body would be dismembered, including his head cut off by Coonan and tossed in the Hudson River. Because Coonan and other members of the Westies owed him upwards of $70,000 and didn't want to pay him back. The meeting between the Westies and Big Paul was set to be at Tommaso's restaurant in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. So beforehand, Coonan and Mickey Featherstone, also of the Westies, set a plan in motion to try to get the drop on the Gambino members Big Paul, as well as Roy DeMeo, who helped orchestrate the meeting between the two crews by sending two of their younger associates to a restaurant to order a big meal and try to listen in on the Gambino's conversation. Coonan and Featherstone also told the rest of the Westies members who were gathered at Featherstone's apartment their role in the meeting as well. According to the book, The Westies, Coonan was quoted, me and Mickey gonna go to the restaurant, just like we supposed to. See what these guys gotta say for themselves. But if you don't hear from us in two hours, two fucking hours, there's a social club next to Tommaso's. Vets and Friends, it's called. You come in there blasting with everything we got. The book went on to say Jimmy Coonan also told the men, we got no choice. We've been called. If we don't go, we's gonna get whacked. If we do go, we might still get whacked. But I swear to Christ, if we do, I want this to be the biggest fucking slaughter since the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It's then said Coonan bought out a laundry bag containing an arsenal of weapons, including 25s, 32s, 38s, 45s with silencers, a 9mm machine gun, grenades, two Japanese machetes, ski masks, walkie-talkies, bulletproof vests, and handcuffs. Coonan and Featherstone then strapped themselves each with a 25 and 38 caliber before making their way to Coonan's car to head out. On their way to the car, Coonan gave Featherstone an out by telling him he would understand if Mickey didn't want to go. This meeting with the Italians was Coonan's work because Coonan looked up to the Italian's way of doing things over the Irish mob's way. And Coonan viewed it as if he could get in with the Gambinos, that he had finally made it big time. But Featherstone disagreed. He felt the Italian Mafia couldn't be trusted, and he didn't respect the way in which they would kill each other. He said they didn't have the balls to look someone in the eyes before they killed them. He said that was the difference between the Italians and the Irish. But Mickey was loyal to Coonan and told him if they were going to kill Coonan, they were going to kill him too, and went through with the plan anyway. They would arrive at Tommaso's around 7 p.m. and sat at the bar near the entrance and ordered drinks to wait for Big Paul and Roy DeMeo. Five minutes later, DeMeo would arrive through the back entrance in a suit and tie and approach the men saying, you guys ready? Both of them nodded in agreement. DeMeo would then lean in and whisper to them, whatever you do, don't admit nothing about Ruby Stein. They're gonna ask you about Ruby and you tell them you don't know nothing. And when they ask about Ruby's black book, you say, what black book? They nodded again in agreement to which DeMeo replied, good. Everything's gonna be fine. DeMeo would then lead them towards the back of the restaurant to a room past the restrooms. And upon entering, they would see a huge horseshoe shaped table. And seating at the table would be some of La Cosa Nostra's most powerful leaders at the time, including Carmine Lombardozzi of the Gambino family, Consigliere Joanne Gallo, underboss Neil Della Croce, Nino Gaggi, another Gambino underboss, 
and a representative from the Genovese family on behalf of Fat Tony Salerno was a man named Funzi Thierry. And last but not least, seated at the head of the table was Gambino boss, Paul Big Paul Castellano. Coonan would then hand Big Paul a box of Cuban cigars as a gesture of good faith. Said Castellano smiled at Coonan and passed his cigar box around for the rest of the men to look at. And then Featherstone and Coonan would be formally introduced to all the men that were present. After the Irish gangsters took their seats, food started coming in as the men all had small talk. But when Fat Tony's representative, Funzi Thierry, whispered something in Big Paul's ear, he cleared his throat to get the attention of the room and started addressing Coonan. Jimmy, he said, and then paused and asked Coonan if he minded if he called him Jimmy, to which Coonan replied, of course not. Big Paul went on to explain why Ruby Stein's death was such a big issue to the family, and then straight out asked Coonan if him or any of his people had anything to do with the murder of their good friend. Coonan replied by telling Castellano, no, we didn't have nothing to do with that. Castellano then asked Coonan if he was sure, and Jimmy responded by saying, yes, sir, without a doubt. Then Castellano asked Coonan about Ruby Stein's black book, and Coonan told him he didn't know what they were talking about. Big Paul then told him the book was worth millions of dollars of Shylock loans in it, and that the men there needed it. Coonan told Paul he wished he could help, but he knew nothing about any of it. Funzy Terry then cut in and asked Coonan, didn't you guys owe Ruby money? Jimmy responded by telling him yes, but the loans were paid back in full, then after being grilled a little bit more and Coonan not backing down, Big Paul would then tell Coonan, quote, All right, Jimmy, this is our position. From now on, you're with us, which means you got to stop acting like cowboys, like wild men. If anybody is to be removed, you have to clear it with my people, capiche? Everything goes through Nino or Roy. Big Paul then told him the book was worth millions of dollars of Shylock loans in it and that the men there needed it. Coonan told Paul he wished he could help, but he knew nothing about any of it. Funzy Terry then cut in and asked Coonan, didn't you guys owe Ruby money? Jimmy responded by telling him yes, but the loans were paid back in full. Then after being grilled a little bit more and Coonan not backing down, Big Paul would then tell Coonan, quote, all right, Jimmy, this is our position. From now on, you're with us, which means you gotta stop acting like cowboys, like wild men. If anybody is to be removed, you have to clear it with my people, capiche? Everything goes through Nino or Roy. Castellano went on to tell Coonan they would now have permission to use the Gambino family name to conduct their business moves in Hell's Kitchen, but that the men would have to kick up 10% of what they made. But any money they made off Shylocking, they would work out with Roy DeMeo. Coonan then replied by telling Castellano their numbers racket wasn't doing well but they would build it back up in time. Big Paul responded by telling Coonan that was okay, but made it clear to Coonan that any hits they were going to have to do had to be okay by the family. The men would then finish eating while joking around and conversating. After the meeting was concluded, the Italians would take Mickey Featherstone and Jimmy Coonan to the Vets and Friends Social Club, two doors down from Tommaso's. They would be introduced to some of the 30 plus Italian mobsters inside, as the boys from Manhattan. After the introductions, Big Paul would pull them aside and tell them if they are ever called to Brooklyn, they have no choice but to show up and that they should never bring guns in the club. Meanwhile, both of them were strapped up with two guns apiece. Castellano also told them they were attracting too much publicity and told them how he tries as much as he can to stay out of the newspapers and even once paid off a reporter not to print a story about him. Then, after about a half hour inside with the Italians smoking cigars and drinking whiskey, Coonan and Featherstone realized it was 9 o'clock and they had told the rest of the Westies crew if they weren't out in two hours to come in blasting. So they began saying their goodbyes and moved their conversation out to the front of the club. So if their men came up, they would see them alive and keep it moving. As soon as they possibly could, the two men broke from the conversation and ran to a payphone to call off the ambush. As it would turn out, the men were getting drunk and getting high at Featherstone's apartment. And when nine o'clock hit, one of the men said to wait a few more minutes, which turned into a half hour. Mickey and Jimmy cursed them out for not showing up and then hung up the phone. On the way back to Hell's Kitchen, Coonan and Featherstone laughed about the situation. 
Jimmy was super excited that the meeting was successful and he accomplished his biggest goal, becoming part of La Cosa Nostra. He also told Featherstone that now with their new alliance and for going to the meeting with Coonan, that he would now make lots of money and he promised to take good care of Mickey. Following their sit down with the Gambinos, Mickey and Jimmy would have many meetings with select members of the family, including Nino Gaggi, who they met at the Vets and Friends Club to give information on a series of hits that had happened. They met with Big Paul and his bodyguard, Thomas Bellotti in Little Italy to let Castellano know about a hit he heard was going to happen against one of his crew members. And they had frequent meetings with Roy DeMeo to discuss many different subjects, but mainly about business and money. After the men took Ruby Stein out, DeMeo was now financing Coonan with any loans or payments they needed to make. Although Coonan was more than content with their arrangement, the rest of the Westies crew began to view Coonan in a different light. Coonan had told his crew that by taking out Ruby Stein, all their debt would be cleared. But then Coonan turned around and told his crew they now owed him the money. And on top of it, they felt Coonan was treating the Italians better than his own people. They said that he was being cheap and devious, and one of his other crew members was quoted saying he never seen Coonan show anybody respect like he did Roy DeMeo. Coonan did follow through with his promise to Mickey by giving him 25% of a new numbers racket Coonan had started, and would pay Coonan $200 a week as his driver to collect money on his Shylock business. But even so, Mickey Featherstone wasn't really feeling a new alliance with DeMeo and the Gambinos. He didn't like that they were always catering to the Italians. He felt they were full of shit and called them counterfeit tough guys. He felt the Italians thought too highly of themselves because of their huge army, and for that reason, he felt they could never be trusted. Coon agreed with some of Mickey's views, but he felt the Italians actually feared the Irish mob of Hell's Kitchen. But although Coonan would try to reassure his crew he didn't trust the Italians, his actions seemed to prove different. They felt Coonan let his meeting with the Gambinos at Tommaso's get to his head, and his constant need to prove himself to the crime family was blinding him and making him stupid. One example was when Featherstone warned Coonan about Danny Grillo of the DeMeo crew, who was supposed to be a good friend of Coonan. But Grillo was also a coke fiend and began running up a debt with Coonan, taking loans and not paying him. Mickey told Jimmy the guy was no good, but Jimmy continued to deal with him till one day, Coonan met with Grillo at a diner, and Grillo told Coonan they had to take out another guy. He drove Coonan to a parking garage and gave Coonan a brown paper bag with a silenced pistol inside and told him to wait in the corner and wait for a car with Florida plates and then start shooting. Jimmy was suspicious, so he peeked out a small window in the garage and seen a car with Florida plates full of Grillo's friends. Jimmy immediately took the clip out of the gun and realized there was no bullets in it. Coonan, realizing he was being set up, snuck out of the garage and caught a cab back to Manhattan. Coonan, Featherstone, and the Westies made multiple attempts on whacking Grillo, but could never get the job done. They had talked about trying to get the hit authorized by the Gambinos, but decided they couldn't trust him, being that Grillo was so close to DeMeo. But one day, they were called to the Skyline Motor Inn on 10th Avenue to meet Roy DeMeo, where DeMeo, oblivious to Coonan's beef with Grillo, told Coonan he needed to take Grillo out for being a lowlife and a punk. Grillo had stole $100,000 from a safety deposit box belonging to the Canarsie crew, and Grillo gambled all the money away. The mayo told them after they killed Grillo and disappeared his body that they were to drive his car to the Brooklyn Bridge and leave the door open to make it appear Grillo was depressed and committed suicide. Coonan then confided in DeMeo about the issues Coonan was also having with Grillo, and DeMeo responded telling Coonan, you should have told me, I would have chopped him in pieces instead of cutting him in half. After the Westies and Gambino alliance, investigators started hearing on the street that the Westies were connected with Castellano, but with all their surveillance, they could never place Coonan or Featherstone with Big Paul or Roy DeMeo, and began getting frustrated. So Detective Sergeant Joe Coffey of the Homicide Task Force sent word out that he wanted to meet with Big Paul and ask him directly. Castellano got the message and set the meeting for 7 o'clock at Tommaso. Castellano arrived with eight crew members who waited 
with Coffee's partner while Castellano and Coffee sat to eat. Coffee asked Castellano if he was working with the two Irish kids from Manhattan, and Castellano admitted to meeting with them, but told the cop they were good kids and denied any connection from Cosa Nostra to the Westies. Needless to say, the Westies' connection to the most powerful crime family in the country at the time legitimized the Westies' crew and solidified them in the community. The west side of Manhattan was now known to be run by Coonan and the Westies, which was mostly referred to as the West Side Irish Mob. They now had the respect and the power Coonan was aiming for, and any bad blood that was left behind following the hit on former Westies boss Mickey Spillane was now absolved. Spillane was shot five times in the head by two different revolvers outside of his Woodside Queens apartment by Roy DeMeo as a favor to Jimmy Coonan and also to help him progress in the Gambino family under Paul Castellano who was having issues with Spillane over the building of the Javits Center being built in Spillane's West Side territory. Spillane was making a fortune off of his West Side rackets and refused to give the Italians a piece of the action. During Spillane's reign as boss, the Genovese crime family was pressuring Spillane for a piece of the pie, but when Spillane refused, the Genovese hired a rogue Irish hitman, Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan, to take out three of Spillane's chief lieutenants, and because of the increasing threats Spillane was getting from the Italians, he decided to take his family out of Hell's Kitchen and relocate them to an apartment building in Woodside, Queens. A fun fact, Spillane was friends with my grandfather's brother and developed a relationship with my grandfather who grew up on 8th Avenue in Hell's Kitchen as well. Both my grandfather and his brother worked for Spillane at the shipping docks in Hell's Kitchen and my grandfather, grandmother, my mother and her brothers lived at the same apartments in Woodside, Queens where Spillane was shot to death. And Spillane got the idea to move to these apartments for my grandfather. But as told by my mother, my grandmother didn't like all the gangsters always in and out of the apartments for Spillane and made my grandfather move out not long before Spillane was killed. Now back to the story, as Coonan continued to hang around the Italians, he started to mimic their ways, dressing and acting like them. And this didn't sit well with the rest of the crew. They gradually began to grow more distaste for Coonan, including Featherstone who felt Coonan's head was getting too big. Coonan began recklessly whacking people, not considering the effects it would have on his crew, driving them further away from him. Also, as part of the DeMeo recruiting the Westies to the Gambinos and taking out Spillane, he was then promoted by Big Paul Castellano, who made DeMeo a made man and let him run his own crew. The DeMeo crew is responsible for up to 250 murders. Some say they averaged a body a week and they were considered the most savage crew since the Murder, Inc. hit squad. DeMeo developed a like in the Coonan early on because of his willingness to get his hands dirty and similar style when it came to murdering and dismembering bodies. By the 1980s, Coonan and Featherstone were both in prison, and while Coonan was still being paid for his rackets and kicking up 10% to the Gambinos, Mickey wasn't making a dollar. After they were both released a few years later, the dynamic between Mickey and Jimmy changed. While Coonan began spending most of his time with the Italians, Mickey and the other Westies guys began talking about whacking Coonan, but never followed through. Not long after, DeMeo was busted for his international luxury car theft ring, which got boss Paul Castellano indicted as well. Castellano, not knowing if DeMeo would flip, decided DeMeo had to go. The murder contract would be passed around before his own crew finally took the contract and took DeMeo out. With DeMeo gone, another Gambino member was appointed DeMeo's position as a contact to the Westies, but Coonan wasn't a fan of Dan Marino. By the mid 80s, Jimmy's crew were actively plotting his murder with plans for Mickey to step up in his place, but Coonan was able to sweet talk his guys and get them back on his side. But when Coonan ordered Mickey to do a hit and Mickey refused, Coonan set Featherstone up by having Billy Boken disguise himself to look like Mickey Featherstone and commit a murder, and his plot worked, getting Featherstone convicted on a murder charge. In retaliation, Mickey Featherstone took a deal with the government to testify against Coonan and the Westies on RICO charges, getting Coonan convicted and sentenced to 75 years in prison. 
It's also said that after John Gotti had took out Big Paul Castellano and became official boss of the Gambinos, he put Joe the German Watts as a li liaison to the Westies and would have them doing work for him as well. After the feds took Coonan and other members of the Westies down, that hardcore criminal element that once ruled Hell's Kitchen for decades had slowly faded away. After Featherstone's cooperation, his murder conviction was overturned and he was released and now lives in anonymity in the Witness Protection Program. Jimmy Coon is currently serving a sentence at Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. And James McElroy of the Westies was sentenced to 60 years and ended up, ended up dying in 2011 in a California prison. One more fun fact, Jimmy Coonan had a red van which the Westies used to transport weapons and dismembered bodies from the Gemini Lounge to be disposed of, which he joked about calling it the meat wagon. I hope you enjoyed this video of breaking down the alliance between the Gambinos and the Westies and Coonan's relationship with Roy DeMeo. For more detailed videos like this, subscribe and click that notification bell. Don't forget to smash the like button. Thank you for watching. It's Wise God TV.